Zelda Ocarina of Time, one of the most iconic games in speedrunning, and one that on the surface seems incredibly daunting to run. From a viewer's perspective, the glitches are just ridiculous. A lot of people look and go, nah, there's no way I can do any of that. I'll stick with Mario 64. All my favorite streamers run 16 star anyways. But would you believe me that Ocarina Time speedruns are just as easy to learn as Mario? Dare I say, even easier at points? It may sound like a hard sell, especially with relatively fewer people choosing to learn an Ocarina of Time speedrun nowadays as opposed to Mario 64. But not too long ago, these two games stood side by side as the most actively speedrun games, and their most popular categories have thousands of runs on their leaderboards. While Ocarina of Time speedrunning still has a very active and passionate community today, general interest outside of the community seems to have fallen in recent years. This is likely due to the discovery and implementation of stale reference manipulation, the most broken glitch in the N64 Zelda games, which has admittedly confused and alienated many outsiders who claim SRM ruined the game, despite it merely adding more categories to a leaderboard where the majority of them still ban SRM. So if you aren't a fan of SRM, don't worry. By the end of this video, I hope you'll see how fun and surprisingly easy it is to become pretty decent at speedrunning Ocarina of Time in just one week. For this challenge, our category of choice is Defeat Ganon, No SRM, which aims to beat the game as fast as possible without SRM. Think of it like the OOT equivalent of 16 star. It's a legacy category that bans a major glitch used in the current fastest any percent route, but is still short, iconic, easy to follow, and a very beginner-friendly speedrun, which is why it still remains the most run category in the game. It only took me one day to learn the defeat Ganon route and complete my first run, despite me never having done any of these glitches before. I credit my ability to pick up the run quickly thanks to the many resources there were available for learning. These include the Ocarina of Time speedrunning discord, and a very good beginner tutorial by a high level runner, Drunkle Titus, which I've linked in the pinned comment and in the description below. But what arguably made the learning process incredibly efficient was GZ, the Ocarina of Time speedrunning practice ROM developed by Glank, with assistance from other community members. GZ features many cool features to make practice less tedious, including save states, warps, inventory modifiers, you name it. I installed GZ on my Wii to use solely for practice, while I used an official Japanese Wii Virtual Console release for the actual runs. While it is encouraged to submit runs on official platforms such as N64 and Wii Virtual Console, feel free to follow along on an emulator to start, and see how you like doing runs and tricks before you invest money in official hardware. With everything set up, I began day one by practicing the first objective of the run, obtaining the Kokiri Sword. By backflipping from the balcony and walking backwards, I can reach this hill faster than walking forward and rolling, as holding Z and walking backwards is faster over relatively long distances. Once I started making my way up the hill, I practiced lining up the crawl space leading to the boulder maze so I can turn around and backwalk directly to the hole while backflipping over the fences. As expected, my movement was a bit sloppy, but I wasn't worried, as I know given enough time, it would be second nature. Crawl in the hole, crawl out of the hole. One, two hops to the right. Backwalk and grab the rupees. One, two, three, four. Backwalk and open the chest. After a few minutes of practicing getting the sword, it was time to leave, which took a bit of practice to get down. Once I entered the crawl space, I had a bit of time before I needed to press forward, so I took the opportunity to pause and equip the sword, which I was about to need. Now, in a casual playthrough, this is where you now gather a total of 40 rupees within this area to purchase the Kokiri shield, as you will need to have a sword and shield equipped before Maida will allow you to reach the Great Deku Tree. But for this speedrun, we're gonna take a quick detour and save that part for later. Instead, we're gonna head to the Lost Woods and perform a sequence break. But as I was heading to enact the daring escape, I noticed something was very wrong. When I was practicing my movement earlier, I accidentally Z-targeted this rock, and I couldn't untarget. Oh no, I forgot to do the one thing that makes me a real Zelda player, selecting the hold option for Z-targeting. By default, Z-targeting is set to switch in the options, which uses a Z button, or in my case, L, as a toggle button for targeting where you will remain locked on to whatever you're targeting after you release Z. 
and you have to press Z again to untarget. However, if there is a second targetable entity around, it will lock onto that instead of untargeting completely. For several reasons, this annoys the hell out of me, and I know I'm not alone in this. So if you want to be a real Zelda player, I recommend changing this option to hold during the file select, which only targets an object or nearby when Z is held. Once that was fixed, I made my way to this pond in the Lost Woods, where at the bottom, there is a shortcut out of the forest that leads to Zora's River, which can be reached with the help of the increased diving abilities of the Silver Scale. However, this is an item obtained later in the game in Zora's Domain. So how do you dive to the bottom without it? It's actually really simple. You Navi dive. By grabbing onto the ledge of this slab, pressing B to draw the sword and B again, you jump slash right when you're on the edge, and when Link lands, Press C up whenever Navi has something to say, as indicated up here, and Link will plummet to the bottom of the pond. The water collision will only return when you close the text box, after which you can swim directly into the exit. During runs, you could actually time this with a background music so you can time it before the Navi prompt even appears. That's also the time when... This trick, Aqua Escape, is pretty easy with the Navi dive, but there's a slightly faster and trickier method I wanted to try. It is possible to clip into the slab and swim into the loading zone to Zora's River with a precise setup. It can be done with a sword or a Deku stick, and it's faster since you don't have to wait for Navi. While it would have been cool to implement this intermediate strat, I quickly realized I was not going to be consistent without a lot more practice, and since it didn't save that much time over the Navi dive, I just stuck with the easier method for the challenge so I can move on. Since remember, I made it my goal to learn and complete a run on the first day. I couldn't dilly-dally for too long because there were other challenging tricks that were more important coming up soon. If you've never seen this run before, you may be wondering, why am I leaving the forest? Well, the reason why we escape from the forest is so we can acquire the most important item of the whole run. A bottle. The fastest one to get is from gathering seven cuckoos scattered throughout Kakariko Village, which is close to the base of Zora's river. We'll get to explaining why the bottle's important later, cause right now, we are in a race against time. And no, I'm not talking about that timer, I'm talking about that one. Yeah, the sun. When you're outside of a town or some other place of interest, the in-game time is no longer frozen, and it is currently midday. The bottle is only available during the daytime, and the sun is gonna set soon, so we need to haul ass so we can make it to Kakariko in time. After rolling across some bridges, we begin swimming down the river as quickly as we can, picking up the rupees we need for the shield along the way. The most important of these is a red rupee, worth 20 rupees. This rupee is intended to be collected by swimming down this part of the river, which isn't the way that we're heading down. At this part of the river, we can exit the water and walk around and get the rupee this way, but we can do it a bit faster. By diving while facing left heading down towards this drop-off, we can set up a jump slash trick off of this ledge, where the recoil of the sword will propel Link far enough the other way to collect the red rupee. I spent several minutes trying to nail this trick, to no avail. I was following the tutorial I mentioned earlier, but I noticed something was bothering me. I was diving, but I wasn't getting the jump slash towards the wall after. This is when I began to consult the tutorial again, and had an epiphany. Left throughout the oh, island. that's what I did wrong. See, see, this is why you always have to look over guides because the problem there was that I wasn't holding left before I pressed A. Let's try that out. We're in here, boys. Consistency? Yo, we just got that three times in a row! Let's go! Woo! This is what I love to see. With this realization, I was beginning to grab the red rupee more consistently. And if I didn't get in a run, I can always just go for the backup I mentioned earlier. Although it would make the in-game time a bit tighter. Once I was satisfied, I swam all the way down to the riverbank entering Hyrule Field to practice a trick that would help me reach Kakariko much faster. While I could simply just backwalk there and get briefly stopped by the owl, 
I decided to learn the Water Extended Super Slide, or WES for short. By jump slashing this spot on the wall while holding the smallest possible movement input to the right, just outside of the joystick's dead zone where Link normally does a little shuffle on the ground, I can preserve the backwards momentum from the jump slash recoil in and out of the water, which is not only faster than back walking, but also skips talking to the owl, which saves some extra time. These two tricks were surprisingly easy to get down, while still looking cool and impressive. <laughs> boy. I sure hope my hubris doesn't get the best of me. We enter the village of Kakariko as Twilight begins to cover all of Hyrule. But now is not the time to go to bed just yet. We have some chickens to save. One near the entrance gate, another trapped in a wooden box. One near the gate to Death Mountain, which is used to reach the next one atop a ledge. These four are thrown into the pen as we search for the last three hanging around the windmill. I repeatedly practice this path so I can claim my bottle slowly but surely getting the hang of the movement, as well as some techniques to corral the chickens much closer to the pen. Once I was satisfied, I rolled over to this rock and caught some bugs that were living under it, for they would come into play for an even bigger bug coming up. But as the sun is close to setting, it is time for Link to head to bed. We save and reset so we can spawn back in Link's house. Nap time's over. It's finally time to tackle the Deku Tree, Using the rupees I gathered, I buy a shield from the shop so Mido lets us through, kill the Deku Baba on the way to pick up a Deku Stick before heading inside the tree. And it's easily the hardest part of the run. First things first, this Baba is killed so we can pick up 5 Deku Nuts, which will be very important coming up. After practicing skipping Navi's annoying text by pulling out a stick before grabbing these vines, I made my way upstairs to the room containing the Fairy Slingshot. Also, quick PSA, it is way faster to not jump on this falling platform to reach the chest, so instead, you can use it to get back out instead of having to shoot out a ladder. With the slingshot acquired, I climbed up to the top, dropped down to break the web blocking access to the basement, and then practiced a precise jump that would allow me to reach the boss room much quicker. Normally, you can't jump up high enough to reach this ledge, but with the proper position and angle, which has a pretty reliable setup, you can skip most of basement 1. From there, I burned down the web leading to basement 2, damaged down to half a heart, and solved the Deku Scrub's riddle. 2, 3, 1, and enter Goma's lair. This boss fight is very annoying in this run. Our objective is not only to defeat Goma within seconds, which already isn't the easiest task, but also to die at the same time you land the killing blow. This is accomplished by entering the fight by jump slashing with the Deku Stick, storing that attack's greater damage value so I can crouch stab Goma after stunning her with a Deku Nut and then stun her again with a very tight window so I can get another stab in before jump slashing with the sword to end Goma and myself. Once I was comfortable with the quick kill, I then practiced a cool recoil trick to get back into the boss room much faster. And you may be wondering, if I killed Goma and died just to get to the start of the Deku Tree, only returned straight to the boss room, what was the point of me death warping? The answer is right in front of me, or rather, what isn't in front of me anymore. When I entered Goma's lair the first time, a massive stone slab fell and closed off the path I came from. I need that path open after Goma was defeated, but it didn't reopen after defeating her. I needed to enter the room again, which is why I died on purpose. We need this path open because it is now time to perform one of Ocarina of Time's most iconic glitches the wrong warp. Positioning myself at the center of the door I just came from, I release the bugs I caught in Kakariko and catch them again. Catching bugs, fish, or a fairy in a bottle keeps the bottle in Link's hand until I put it away. In this state, I backwalk until I cross the bump and backflip three times. In the middle of the last flip, I press the bottle button and then the sword button immediately after, all while still being in midair. Landing on the edge of the blue warp, I play my sword like an Akrita instead of being taken away by the blue warp back outside the Deku Tree. This allows me to move around after I stop playing my sword Akarina, and if I exit through the door to the basement on the same frame that the blue warp takes me away, I find myself in Ganon's collapsing tower at the end of the game. This trick looks insane, and kind of intimidating too. On the surface, it sounds so hard that you never want to consider learning the speedrun. Go through the door too early, and you'll be back outside the boss room. Go through too late, 
and you'll be taken to the Kokiri Emerald cutscene as intended. Frame perfect sounds demanding, but thanks to a great setup made by Alien Squeaky Toy, it's actually super easy to get down quickly. Before I stop playing the Sword Ocarina, I hold down, and when Link takes a step, I throw a Deku Nut and hold Z while he's in the middle of the throwing animation, and hold right. I have Link take six steps to the right before throwing another nut while holding Z and right. Once I cross the bump, the blue warp timer is frozen as I'm outside of its radius, and I can go to the door at my desired pace. And once I enter, voila, easy. Honestly, the part I struggled with the most is landing on the edge of the blue warp rather than the movement afterwards. But with enough practice, I was ready to move on to escaping Ganon's castle. At this point, I could exit outside and go through the collapse sequence in a mostly intentional manner. The only other trick I would have to perform is the infinite sword glitch, or ISG for short. By crouch stabbing with a sword or stick, and then quickly targeting an enemy and calling Navi mid-stab, I could turn my Deku stick into an infinitely swinging, killing machine, allowing me to make quick work of the Stalfos. But I chose not to. Was it because I found ISG too intimidating? Hell no! Honestly, it's super easy. There was just a relatively new trick that skipped the collapse sequence almost entirely. By getting into a precise position and pause buffering a triple slash combo with the sword in a specific manner, I could pull out the slingshot as I clipped into the stairs behind me, allowing me to fall close to the bottom. This trick and setup may seem super involved, but one of the great things about speedrunning Ocarina Time is that you can easily frame advance between pausing and buffering the inputs after unpausing, which is how many people can perform tricks like these that require frame-perfect inputs. If you want to learn this speedrun, I think that this collapse skip is something you should at least make an effort to learn. With at least an hour's worth of practice, you should be able to get it down. But if not, going the normal way only loses a couple minutes, and there's no shame in doing that. After escaping the collapsing tower, all that's left is to defeat Ganon. You know, the entire point of the run. Honestly, this part of the run is a cakewalk. You use ISG with the Deku Stick, and Young Link can just walk under Ganon and hit his tail weak point so easily. Even if you miss ISG the first time, you can back up away from the path of Ganon's swords and try again. It's surprisingly hard to die in the fight, considering this is the final boss, and a single hit will kill Link in one hit with three hearts. I had just spent a couple hours of my evening learning the routes and all the important tricks. It was time to begin my very first speedrun of Ocarina of Time. To set up some good vibes, I named Link Banjo and made my way outside. I was making my way through Kokiri Forest, albeit with some very sketchy movement as is typical for first runs, feeling both nervous and excited. And oh boy, how interesting this run would turn out to be. After some more sloppy movement heading to Zora's River, I tried going for the Red Rupee with full confidence. I missed, but that's okay because I did the backup. What wasn't okay was that the sun was beginning to set and I needed to make it to Kakariko on time. I was risking having to wait through the night before I can get my bottle. So I went for a Hail Mary. The Wes. No, I still. I nearly made it to Kakariko, but my butter fingers dropped the ESS position. Ugh, after getting stopped by the owl, I needed to move and fast. I counted my blessings as I took my sweet time picking up the chicks. Despite the obvious jank, I was having a great first run, and I made my way to the Deku Tree with utmost optimism, and lots of spaghetti. All things considered, things were going very well for first run standards. Let's see how Goma went! If only I remembered I had a slingshot sooner. Well, of course something bad was going to happen in the first run. I just didn't think it was going to be dying to Goma. Twice. But I was so close to the end. I couldn't give up. Let's see how the wrong warp went.
awesome. Now, for Collapse Skip. Yeah, I could use some more practice, but I could save that for tomorrow. It was time to cross the finish line. I sat there thinking about what could have been had I not died to Goma twice. Despite nailing a fairly solid first run with just a few hours of learning and practice, I knew I was capable of sub 30 minute time. I was super motivated to totally crush it on day two. Right away, I was playing much cleaner and feeling much more confident in my play. It didn't take long for me to breeze through Kakariko and zip through the Deku Tree, but Sooner or later with speedrunning, especially as a newbie, you'll be forced to come face to face with your demons. And mine was Goma. And soon after, it was the Wes. Although I had felt like I was decently practiced, I was beginning to have a hard time getting the ball rolling, but once I got that ball rolling, it felt amazing. Did I make it in time? Yes! We did it! Saved. Finally. What a heartbreaker. If I had just waited to re-equip my stick, I would have been able to kill Ganon and get a fat PB. But that's okay. I just kept playing. I just wanted that fat second PB, and I was only getting better with time. But I'm not gonna lie, a couple hours into attempts, I was starting to get a bit discouraged, but I refused to go to bed without at least beating my benchmark time, preferably under half an hour at that. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait much longer. I definitely needed more practice with Collapse Skip, but at least I was ahead by a fairly large margin. All I needed to do was close it out. Let's go! Let's go! Get some Komodo hypes in the chat! Let's go! As I basked in my fat second PB hype, I was filled with glee thinking about how fast I can improve with a bit more practice on Goma and Collapse Skip. I was looking forward to hitting the ground running the next day. However, I knew I wouldn't have much time for runs on day three, Friday. That evening, I was going to head over to a sleepover with some friends, but I still wanted to get some runs in before I left. The next day, I booted up OT alongside my pal TJ because I really wanted to get a PB and show off some mind-blowing glitches I knew he had never seen before. Talk about killing two birds with one stone, but in reality, it was more like killing two runs with two mistakes. I was fine with that, as not every day running is going to be amazing or anything. I left to spend some quality time with my friends, and I knew OT would be waiting for me when I came back the next day. And... Ugh, I don't think I feel so good. Alright, John. Let me take this over for you. 
Hi, I'm TJ, the guy sitting right there. Since it was kind of my fault that John couldn't stream for the fourth day, I'm going to explain why. Shortly after we finished day three, we went to our friend's house and played a lovely game of Mario Party. And like we always do, we had steaks. And wouldn't you guess it? <laughs> wrong way, dumbass! <laughs> no! John, you went what? the wrong way! Did he actually? Yes! Wait, 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 the wrong wait. way! Good old lunatic Jay lost. So for his punishment, the non-fourth placers built a very special burrito for him to snack on. Now, this wasn't going to be your typical burrito. There were some rules for the ingredients, like we needed a base flour tortilla and refried beans. Then we got to pick five ingredients from five food categories to spice it up and make it a very special burrito for our good friend. And those categories were cheese, vegetables, meat, condiments, and the mystery ingredient of our choosing. Now, while we sat John down to watch some uh, Family Guy, we went to the local Walmart to see what we could find. And we finally settled on salmon flavored cream cheese, ham and cheese bologna, mint leaves, goober, that gross peanut butter and jelly mix that nobody really likes but they make anyway, and for the mystery ingredient, we picked an entire head of garlic since John played as Wario. It seemed fitting. Anyway, we slapped this burrito together and watched him take 40 minutes to finish this entire thing. He said it was one of the most miserable experiences of his life and it took him out of commission for the entirety of day four. Sorry, buddy. Yeah, thanks a lot, asshole. Day five was here, the end of my week-long challenge. As soon as I was able to play, I spent an hour practicing all the tricks I was messing up since I wanted to go all out and make this final day really count. Honestly, the run started off very rough. I was having a hard time with West consistency, so I put off doing it for the day until I could figure out what I was doing wrong. But for the most part, I was playing very well, until I wasn't. After a few resets into Zora's River, I was hungry for redemption. And man, did my practice pay off. Let's go, dude! Nice! Here we go. If it's sub 2030, sub 2030, maybe. No, I don't think it's possible. Still real good. I'm, I keep on missing Ganon, but holy hell, we finally got a good collapse skin. That's all that matters. 2036. For my third PB ever, this was a giant leap forward. Sub-20 was already within my grasp, but I knew it wasn't going to be easy to beat. And so, this is where I was a week after learning how to speedrun Ocarina of Time. If there's anything to take away from this, it's that 
Despite how intimidating and convoluted Zelda speedruns look these days, especially Ocarina of Time, it's actually really easy to get into. On par with Mario 64 in terms of barrier to entry in my opinion. I know I've been comparing these two different games a lot, but in addition to their most popular categories having many similarities, they once both stood side by side years ago as the most actively ran and popular speedruns. However, tides began to turn, and not in OOT's favor. And honestly, I blame it on how misunderstood the speedruns are, especially after the discovery of SRM. My main goal with this video was to demystify OOT speedrunning and encourage more of you watching to give it an honest chance. I genuinely believe that Defeat Ganon speedruns are just as easy, if not easier at times, to learn than 16 star. If I can get a 20 minute time into a week into running the game, especially after eating the worst burrito ever, so can you. I've left links to tutorials in the description and the pinned comment below. Defeat Ganon competition is starting to really heat up at the top level, and with the most recent developments, there has never been a better time to get into running this game. With the recent phenomenon of big streamers learning Mario 64 and Minecraft speedruns, I really hope that some start running OOT, as I think it would make for some very entertaining content. I plan on returning to runs relatively soon once I learn some new strats, so please stay tuned for that at twitch.tv slash lunaticj. Now go out there and show me what you're made of. I'll be waiting for some challengers.